Okay, so this week is lecture six, even though it's week nine. Um, after the snowstorm, I recorded lecture five. Currently, 52 people have looked at it out of 100 students. Um, and considering I got about 50 people in here, I'm guessing a good chunk of those 50 people are probably sitting in this room. Um, however, I'm not going over what I did in lecture five because I already taught it to the six students that showed up that day. Power to them. I'm proud of you. Especially the ones that drove in an hour. Yeah. And the, uh, the other one that drove in 45 minutes and then the one that took the bus for an hour and a half. Absolutely, thank you for coming in. The other ones that live in residence and then show up? <laughs> oh, no pity for you. Okay, so today, I'm just going to start talking about uh, FS tab and basically formatting file systems and whatnot. Now, FS tab is a file. It's called FS tab because it stands for file system table. And essentially any file system that you want your Linux system to know about should be list listed in the FS tab. In other words, its purpose is to make mounting file systems faster and easier. If it's not listed in FS tab, you have to list everything manually. If it is listed in FS tab, you can literally issue just a straight up mount command and magic happens. Um, you can set up things to auto mount and whatnot in there. Here's an example of an FS tab. Uh, this is a slightly older slide. As you can see, it talks about ext3, not ext4. Makes absolutely no difference. This could be almost anything. But you'll see the first column is the partition. The second column is where is it, does it mount? The third one is um, the file system. The next one tells it, you know, some default values and how it should behave. And then there's two last columns. I'm trying to remember what they are off the top of my head. Um, but essentially, those are the ones you need. Uh, the next slide actually covers them a little bit more. So field one, like I said, it's the device to be mounted. Usually it's a partition. Two tells you where it's going. And it's the file type, mount options. OK. Option number five, some utilities determine which file systems to back up. If its value is one or greater, it determines the priority. The higher the number, the more important it is. If the file system doesn't need to be backed up for by the backup utilities, set it to zero, it won't get backed up. And then the last field, which like I said a minute ago, I couldn't remember what they were. That's why they have slides is to determine the order which file system checks are done at boot. Now, a few of you have already experienced this where you're, you boot your VM and it has shit the bed and it talks about file system corrupt and it needs to check the file system. And I've helped a few people recover their file system, they basically by typing FSCK then holding the letter Y down for a while. And that basically what happens is if your system shuts down in an unclean state, on the, when it comes back up, it needs to check the file system, make sure everything's still sane. And that number determines what order it's going to do each of the uh, file system checks in. So you can sort order basically, you know, we're going to file system check the root partition before we go file system check, you know, the user directories. Because it'd be kind of important to bring up the file system before where the utilities are before you have to try to recover stuff. Uh, field six is no value or value of zero means no check. Um, and z if zero is assumed, if you don't give it a value. And you should always make sure that your root volumes check first. And then set it for two for anything else. So if I go back, you see the very first line is your root partition. And the last number on the end is telling it. You know, when you come back from an unclean state, check this one first. And then 
the NF NTFS one, so SD3 come is checked second, essentially. All right. Now, in the options, so when you look at that column with all the different mounting options, so the one that says default, 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 no auto, no owner, read only, these are the uh, some of the options you have in there. So auto means mounted with the A option, means it can be auto mounted, no auto. It cannot mount when the computer first starts up. It has to be mounted later. Uh, examples of this would be a CD-ROM. You don't want it to be mounted right off the bat. You want to mount it when you want to go use it. Um, exec means you're allowed to execute the binaries on that disk. You can theoretically mount a drive and say you're never allowed to run executables off this. And can somebody think of a good reason why you'd want to mount something and not allow it to run programs off of? Yes. Secret level network, um, another reason you might want to not allow exec to run. Uh, you're checking it in case it's been uh, trojaned, rooted, viruses. Maybe you don't want programs to run off that disk because it's been compromised at some point in its existence and you can't trust what's on there. Therefore, if you don't have the exec permission turned on for that entire drive, whatever's on there can't run. If you copy it off of there, it'll run and then you're being stupid. But you know, if you don't give the exec option along for the ride, that means the file system will stay safe. RO means read only. Read write means read write. Now, a CD-ROM is usually mounted read only. Why? Because most of the time CDs are already, you know, what's the phrase? Finalized. That's the word. And you can't write to it anymore anyways, therefore they're read only. Um, no user means a regular user can't mount this file system. As it stands, most regular users can mount file systems if the permissions allow it. However, um, there's options that can say, you know, average user cannot mount this drive. Again, maybe you have a partition that the average user shouldn't be allowed to see, only roots allowed to see it. And sometimes you have a combination of these so that you'd have like uh, read only, no user, and you don't have exec turned on because you're trying it's a drive you're trying to recover. So you don't want people to mess with it. Okay. Mounting option. If you have user, that means any user can mount the file system. However, whoever mounts it has to unmount it unless they're root. So if, for example, you've got a user and he mounts a partition and you come in after the fact and you're not root, you can't unmount that permit that partition. That user owns that partition as long as it's mounted, essentially. Um, if you use users as opposed to user, that means any user can mount it and any user can unmount. So one person can mount it, the other person could go unmount it while it's still mounted and somebody's using it just for fun. Not a good combination. Um, defaults. Defaults means use the default options versus auto no user. So when you see that example, that table that I had going earlier, that means literally that. You know, it can be mount and read write, read write, which the root partition should be. It should be able to be allowed to execute because, you know, what's the point of mounting your Linux base Linux file system if you can't run a program off of it? It's designed to auto mount. When the computer starts up, it mounts automatically. No user means nobody's allowed to mount and unmount it except for root, because you don't want Joe user unmounting the root file system while the system's in use. I can think of all kinds of things that can go horribly wrong. Okay. File systems do not need to be listed in FS tab to be mounted. Having them there makes it easier. Um, so when the, the file systems are listed in FS tab, they can be automatically mounted. Those that aren't mounted, the mount command will run easier, obviously, because you have all the options. Uh, if you don't record in the FS tab, you have to specify the file system, the file type, the mount point. You have to tell it everything about the file system you're working with. Now, the mount command is kind of clever. It actually has half a brain. It's actually able to guess what file system you're playing with most of the time. 
but you know there's times it doesn't. Now there's a few other items that's useful to know about. The UUID, which that example we had there didn't have it, but if I go You'll see that in my FS tab, it looks a little weird. It uses UUIDs instead. And so instead of last slash dev slash slash DA, it's actually using the UUID. Um, theoretically, it's possible that the disks will move, but the partition identifiers won't. So if I take the contents of that partition, copy it to another disk, and turn the computer off, turn the computer on again, the computer's still able to guess what partition you're talking about because it's using a UUID instead of an actual path. So when you use the UUID, it changing the order of the hard disks, taking out hard drives will not affect the mount points. Uh, for example, let's say you have two hard drives in your computer and you have the original one you had and then you have a new hard drive, and you clone the first drive to the second drive. So now you have an SDA and an SDB. And then you unplug the first drive. Now what was an SDB is now SDA because it's the first drive that's detected. But because some of the other IDs, like the disk ID and stuff, changed, and the old Linux back in the day would lose it. Now that they use UUIDs, it recognizes that partition for what it is and it allows it to be mounted. Or you could have your root partition actually on drive, on your second drive. So you have laptops, so you have no idea what I'm talking about when you're talking about putting in drives and taking drives out. But anybody here actually have a desktop PC where they've actually replaced hard drives on them at least once in their experience? Okay. You know, you plug in a drive, then you unplug your primary drive. Now, anybody here remember the old pre-SATA drives? Okay, yay. So you got SATA drives, right? You got the two little connectors. And then you what they used to call the PATA drives, P-A-T-A drives, with the big wide ribbon cable, where you had a master and a slave drive on each ribbon. And if you unplug the master drive, everything stopped working. This stuff for UUID sort of came along for them because it, the drives were actually identified by where they were plugged in. So if you took a drive, you moved it from one spot to the other, the OS didn't know where things were. The UUIDs, since the partitions are named that way, it doesn't make a difference what drive they're on. The Linux file system will actually know where to go grab its, its stuff. It's like magic. Um, and I just finished, basically finished explaining the rest of that in a roundabout way. Um, there is a command to identify the UUIDs. It's called BLKID, was block ID. Uh, you can also use it to find out what file system a given partition has. So I ran that command on my SDA1, and you can see that there's the UUID and then the type, so you know what kind of file system it is, and you know it's UUID. Now, the mount command serves to attach a file system to any, from any block device to the directory structure somewhere. Now, one of the things about mounting that some people have a hard time grasping is that it tends to, it treats the partition like a folder or a directory. So you'd create a mount somewhere, a mount point, you create a temporary directory somewhere, and when you mount it, the partition is now just another folder on your file system. You go do stuff in there, yay, it's as if it's part of the file system, then you unmount it and it's gone. The files are deleted, they're still in the bin, but it's just you took the box away where it's all, you don't know how to talk to the box anymore. I'll demonstrate that when I do my demo. So mount shows what's currently mounted, mount-a shows all systems, all file systems, so mounts all. Um, you can tell it to mount a specific device by giving it a path. Um, T tells it the file system type. So a complete example is the one at the bottom where I'm mounting, and this gives you a really good idea how old this slide is. 
How many of you remember a floppy disk drive? How many of you actually used one? 1.44 meg, right? And uh, that was the hard floppies. Well, this example is mounting a floppy that's formatted as a fat table, so DOS formatted floppy. And it's going to mount it to a folder called DOS floppy. The dash O gives you options. So remember in the FS tab, there's a list of options you can feed it. Mount takes the same options. So dash O, R O makes it read only. Means you can't change it. And if you want to unmount a file system, it's U mount. Why did they skip the end? I don't know. So the command is not unmount, it's U mount. Um, there's a few error messages you may experience. Device is busy. That means there's something accessing the partition or the disk, and you can't unmount it. Um, and the most common mistake as a root user, people don't think about it, is they unmount their root partition, and the computer goes, no. Then, you know, if you actually manage to unmount the root partition, you end up having to reboot the machine because you're done now. OK. When you mount a file system, there's a few restrictions. Item number one, a mount point, in other words, a directory, can only ever have one file system mounted to it at the same time. If you're having a hard time grasping that, imagine you're in a room and you open a door. That door opens into two other rooms at the same time. Yes, that's, we don't live in a world where tesseracts exist. That's not how it works. So you can only occupy, one thing can occupy space at a time. Otherwise, things go boom. Um, therefore, a directory that is used at mount point can only ever have one file system mounted to it at a time. You want more than one file system mounted at the same place, too bad. Create another directory and mount it somewhere else. That's just how it is. The directory must exist before you mount it. Again, it's like saying, I want to connect a room to this room, but I don't have a door to connect it. So essentially, you want to build, add on to whatever. So you've got a house, and you want to add on to the outside edge of that house. The only way you can do it first is you have to cut out the door before you can add it on. Um, a user mounting the file system has complete access rights to the mount point and the mount command. In other words, if you can't run the mount command, guess what you can't do? Mount the file system. If you can't see the directory where you want to mount it, guess what you can't do? You can't mount to a directory you can't see. If you don't have read, write, execute on that directory, guess what you can't do is you can't mount. Now. If you have a directory that has files in it and you mount to it, the files don't get deleted. It looks like they're gone, but they're not. It becomes invisible until the file system is unmounted. So basically, we're playing. So you got a door that goes to, to, a, to, a, to a room. And you decide, well, no, that door should go to a different room. That first can't go away. It's just you can't see it anymore because you're now looking at a different room. Suddenly you make that second room go away. Hey, look at this. You can see your first room again. It's like magic. Um, I used to actually have a little tunnel that I used to take in as an example of how that would work, and I forgot it at home. There was a cat sitting in it today, and I didn't have to take it away from it. So, But essentially, if you take the tunnel and you connect it to a different room, the first room doesn't go away because the stuff is still there. You're just connected to a different place. So when you move it back to the first place, it's there. I will be demonstrating that. Okay, that was the info dump. Now I'm going to actually do the demonstration for what I was just talking about. Soon, as I manage to roll back my sleeves a little. 
Come on. All right, just so you know, this is a VM I've got two hard drives in it, 20 gig and a 2 gig. My 2 gig drive has absolutely nothing in it. So when you look at my drive mapping, you'll see there's SDA, 1, 2, 5, and then I got an SDB with nothing else. If you've done lab five, this might look a little familiar. So the first thing I got to do before I do anything else is I actually got to create partitions. What command do you use to create a partition? I know some people have done lab five, so you should be able to say this. Yes? Yes. So, so you F disk and you tell it what drive you want to play with. Not a specific partition, you tell it what drive. Since my second drive that's currently empty is called SDB, I'm going to point it to that. Now, here's our happy little F disk. M is for help. It shows you all the commands you can run. And if we're playing with DOS file systems, there's things we can do there. However, the most of the generic commands is what's going to work for us right now. So, first things first is we're going to print the partition table. P for print. And there's nothing there. Surprise. I said it was empty. And then it's empty. Now, we can create partitions. N is to create a partition. P shows us all uh, the partition type, and L shows us all the available types. So if I go L, you'll see it goes from 0 to FF. All kinds of file systems. And here's file system 83, Linux. Do you notice it doesn't talk about, and that's the partition type, so it's a Linux type partition. It doesn't tell you what the file system is going to be, but these are all the, you know, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it tells the different utilities with the rules of engagement what you can do with that drive. For example, you can't create an ext4 file system on an AIX partition. Why? Because AIX belongs to IBM and it's an AIX file system. It's not a Linux file system. So I'm going to create a new partition. It's going to be a primary and I, of course I'm creating my first one. Now First sector, 2048. Anybody want to take a guess why it's 2048? Not zero. Anybody want to take a guess? It's where your partition table is residing. The first 248 cylinders, or the two first 248 sectors, are reserved for your partition table. The partition table is what tells your computer how the drive is divided. It's like a map. So I'm going to start at the beginning. Now, it's kind of cool. You can give it size and number of sectors. You can tell it to increase it by a number. So you can tell it what is the last sector. You can tell it oh, occupy 10,000 sectors. Or you can specify it by size. Way more useful to say I want to create a 200 megabyte partition. I could create a 200K partition. Gigabyte, terabyte, and the P is petabyte. Yeah, I was about to say something really not appropriate about the petabyte. Um, it was almost a Chris Hansen moment. So I'm going to create a 200 meg partition. Bang. Now, I print my partition table once again, and here we go. We've got our device. It shows that it's not set to be bootable. It shows where it starts, where it ends, how many sectors it occupies. So a 200 meg partition occupies 409,000 sectors 
and change. It's a type 83, it means it's for Linux. And, well, ID and type is the same thing. They just list off each other. Now, I'm going to create another partition. Again, it's going to be a primary partition, partition 2. And I'm going to say first sector is this. And then I want it to occupy the rest of the drive. Now, if I accept the default, it means it's going to occupy the rest of the drive completely. So I created a 1.8 gig partition. So here's my two partitions. Some of you have made mistakes at this point. You hit Q. Instead of hitting W. What happens if you hit Q instead of W? Yeah. Doesn't save. You did the work. You hit Q. It quit. Nothing was ever written. All these changes currently are draft. As in, these are the things you're going to the this is what Linux thinks you're going to do to the file system because you've told it you're going to do this. But unlike children, it actually doesn't do it until you tell it to do it. Bang. So I hit right. There it is. Now if I were to go if I go back into it, you can see my partition tables there. Yay for us. All right. So I created partitions. Now I'm going to go to my mount directory. And as you can see, there's nothing in here. I'm going to create a directory called 1. Why? Because I'm lazy. I don't feel like typing more than that. So I'm going to go into 1. <clears throat> so in 1, I created four files. I'm just put doing this as an example for the moment so that my directory structure is set. Now. I can't mount my partitions yet because I never gave them a file system. And the command to create a file system, makefs, mkfs, make file system. Now, there's two versions of the make file system command. There's this one where you tell it, So make file system, type ext4, give it the path to my first partition. Boom. Done. Then there's the shorthand version. mkfs dot ext4 and partition 2. Boom. Done. So file systems are created. They're set. If I go you'll see that the partitions exist the, and they're formatted. Now we've created a partition. We formatted the partition. And every sane system administrator will always tell you the following thing. Always check your file system before you put it in use. Why? Because there once was a time where hard drives were not reliable. Or maybe you needed to add room to your server. So you reached into the back, grabbed the disk, blew the dust off it. Yeah, look at that. It's a 2 gig drive. It's pretty old. Okay. You put it in the system, plug it up, create a file system, then you mount it. Next thing you know, it still doesn't work. Why? Because the drive was bad. So so there's a command called fsck. Now you got the little, you know, nerdy edge lords that like putting that on their shirt because they think they're cool. fsck that. fsck this. It just makes you look like a tool. Because <laughs> anybody who's been around computers long enough, look at that, they go, ha, 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 you're not funny. But you're funny to your friends. So that's all that counts, I guess. So 
FSCK stands for File System Check. And wow, that was amazing, wasn't it? I ran the command, it came back instantly. That one takes a little longer. FSCK basically checks the file system, makes sure everything's good. Now this, for those of you that have come from Windows, have experienced this. And that, if you notice, I started typing in this command by accident. Check disk. Right? When Windows goes bad or DOS would go bad, you'd run the check disk command. CHKDSK. Which is what I was typing, because I'm so used to typing it from back in the day. So same thing. Windows has a tool to check the disk. Linux has a tool to check the disk. There's tools everywhere. Um, FSCK has a bunch of permissions. I mean permissions. Um, arguments. Jeez, that was stupid. And as you notice, these guys thought they were clever. Because, you know, whenever you're running FSCK, you know things have gone bad, right? So they decided to be really nice and call this emergency help. In other words, you, your file system is screwed. And you can't run the man page. So these are the things you should know about. P is to fix it automatically. Why is it P? I don't know. Yeah, Y means assume yes. Because, you know, sometimes you'll run FSCK and there's lots of errors. And, you, for, you know, you have to hit Y every single time it tries to fix something. So, yes, assume it's right. F is force checking even if it's marked clean. V means be like a teenage girl. Sorry, or a teenage boy that has outgoing personality. Talk, talk, talk. I'm sorry. I just offended someone. <laughs> Anyways. All right, so I just did a verbose file system check and I forced it. So here's what it actually does, is it checks inodes, blocks, and sizes. So first thing it does, it checks to see if the inodes are safe. Make sure that if it says certain things should be a certain size that they are. Then it checks to make sure the directory structure is not broken. Um, then it checks reference counts. In other words, if a file references more than one spot, is it still pointing to the right things? And then there's a group permit summary information. And then it shows that there's 11 inodes used. In other words, less than, you know, 0.02%. Um, 0.02, yeah. Out of whatever number of blocks, inodes, these are your blocks. If I were to do the same thing with my primary partition, can't. Why? Because it's mounted. You're not allowed to force the check on a file system unless it's mounted. I'm probably about to reboot my Linux machine. It's busy. So, so it's good. I'm not going to have to restart my Linux machine because it's not going to let me. I usually at this point I get a 50-50 chance it's going to let me do it. So it's not going to let me do it. All right. So I've checked my file system. Actually, I'm going to do the uh, check on SDB2 also, just to make sure. And as you can see, SDB2 is bigger, so it has more inodes and, you know, block usage and stuff like that. All right. So if we remember, I created a directory called 1. Now I'm going to go mount. I'm going to mount my SDB1 to 1. It's type ext4, and I'm going to allow it to be read-write. And it says it can't find it. Why? It's because I forgot one last argument. What's the last argument I forgot to give it? The argument is, where do I put this? So what it just did is it went looking at fstab for this file system, and it says, I can't find it in here, so I don't know where to put it. So if I say, connect it to 1, now I don't get an error message. 
This goes right back to the whole thing when I tell you guys, Linux doesn't tell you when you did a good job. It tells you when you're an idiot. So now if I go into one, one has a lost and found directory. All Linux file systems have a lost and found directory. If your file system goes horribly wrong and it needs to fix it, it puts things it finds in lost and found. So you don't necessarily lose your files, you just lose what they were called. So now I'm going to make, I'm going to So I got three files in here, but if you remember, originally one had file one, two, three, four in it. They're still there. They're just gone invisible for a while. They're in another dimension temporarily. So if I go, now I've unmounted my partition and I've got my files one, two, three, four is back. If I were to mount this again, because I was in there, now the files are there. So when you mount and unmount, all you're doing is you're redirecting a door to a different place. So let's say I got a little tunnel that goes to different places on your on your in your computer. And literally that is all that happens. Now if I were to go So that's unmounted, and I were to go like this. Gone. As you can see, my files are gone because I just formatted the partition. Without it being connected, I just wiped it. Now. The good news is the files aren't really gone. Um, if you have a hex tool, you can actually still get your files out of there. But it's not easy. Um, we used to have something like this in DOS and Windows called undelete. So even if you nuked your partition table, you could still undelete files out of it. It was a cool trick. Um, but yeah. What I just did in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, is essentially labs 5 and 6. So if you watch the recording when you go to do the labs, mind you, labs 5 and 6 has more partitions than an extended partition, but it's essentially what those labs are. So as always, this is a short lecture. Um, I'm going to stop the recording here.